This is Earth Files, the award-winning news site with the latest updates in science, environment, and real X-Files. Podcasting in-depth reports beyond the 6 o'clock news by Emmy Award-winning journalist Linda Moulton Howe. The 1918 Spanish flu was the fastest spreading and most deadly influenza pandemic in recorded history. Worldwide, some 50 million people died. It was caused by an A H1N1 influenza virus, which is why public health officials were so alarmed when a brand new novel version of A H1N1 showed up in Mexico this 2009 spring and began to spread, causing deaths. The 2009 flu virus is a genetic combination of swine, avian, and human genes never seen before. But when genome sequencing was done on the new 2009 flu virus, a specific gene cluster that was on the 1918 AH1N1 that made that virus so lethal, was fortunately missing in this new version emerging in Mexico. Global pandemics occur when an influenza strain comes around that is genetically unique, such as the 2009 AH1N1, and at the same time is easily transmitted between humans. So, did the human population dodge a virus bullet this time around? A virologist at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, does not think we can relax. Paul Gleason, M.D., is professor of molecular virology, microbiology, and pediatrics, and is epidemiologist for the Influenza Research Center at Baylor. He received his M.D. degree in 1956 from the University of Illinois in Chicago. Dr. Gleason trained in pediatrics and also worked as an epidemic intelligence officer with the Communicable Disease Center that eventually evolved into the modern Centers for Disease Control. When the Asian A H2N2 pandemic hit with such a worldwide force in 1957, Dr. Gleason was aware that the first signs of the Asian flu showed up in the United States in June 1957, what Dr. Gleason calls the herald wave before the Asian flu became a serious epidemic in the fall of 1957 through February 1958. Later on, Dr. Gleason published data that showed there were these herald waves of upcoming serious influenza viruses before the 1918 Spanish flu, before the 1957-58 to Asian flu, and before the 1968 Hong Kong flu. This week, I asked Dr. Gleason if he thinks the 2009 AH1N1 could be a herald wave of a much more serious flu epidemic coming in fall 2009. I don't think that we're off the hook in the United States. I don't think we should be complacent to think that we're not going to have it as bad as Mexico because I think that if conditions were different and we were in the fall and it was getting colder, uh, we might see much more disease. 1918, it's now evidence that a milder wave occurred in the uh, late winter and early spring of 1918 before, of course, the major wave, which was in the fall. We saw something similar in 1957 in that the virus was first detected, you know, in the Far East in the spring. It arrived in the United States probably by June, and during the summer, notable outbreaks were noted in uh, Valley Forge for the Boy Scout Jamboree and at a uh, children's church camp in Iowa. Both of those were attended by uh, students and children from all over the country. The virus did not become epidemic until September when the schools went back in session. And, of course, the first wave then, uh, first major wave peaked the last week of October in 1957. But then we had another wave that peaked in the middle of February of 1958. With this idea of there being these herald waves and the fact that in Mexico this current AH1N1 
seem to be more lethal than it was in the United States and other parts of the world. Do you think that could anticipate the possibility that AH1N1 could be more serious and lethal in the United States and the rest of the world by fall 2009? Well, I don't know about the lethality. If you're talking about virulence, what you're implying is that the virus may become more virulent here, but I don't think that's necessary. I think that when the conditions are uh, right for it to spread more readily in our population, then we will see uh, distribution of severity of illness, which will include deaths as well as mild infections. So if we start seeing uh, an epidemic where there are a large number of infections occurring, then I think we'll see the full spectrum of disease. So do you mean that you don't think that there was anything particularly different about the Mexico version of AH1N1 that caused deaths there versus the United States and the rest of the world? That's been one of the big questions. Why were there deaths in Mexico and not elsewhere? I think if you uh, consider... For instance, that Mexico City is one of the largest cities in the world, 20 million people at least, and they're crowded into a fairly small area. It's an area that's um, climate-wise is drier and would tend to be cooler at night, and that would promote you know transmission of the virus better than uh, here in Houston where we're down at sea level with high humidity because we know that the virus spreads more readily when the humidity is low, and of course the temperature is low usually at the same time. What are you looking for to see if, in fact, that is going to be the next big flu epidemic here in the U.S.? The first thing we have to do is to demonstrate that it's not proceeding and progressing on. And so we need to improve our surveillance. And so far, our tests have not been very sensitive. Now, CDC and WHO have just sent out new primers for PCRs which we have uh, used locally here now, and that's going to improve our diagnosis a lot. So as we improve the diagnosis, then we're going to feel more secure about whether this disease is progressing or whether it is uh, becoming sort of quiescent or dampening off for the uh, summertime. Do you mean all flu viruses don't spread well in moisture? The virus has a lipid envelope, and it seems to... uh, remain viable longer when the humidity is low. This has been tested experimentally, you know, to demonstrate this. And it was published many years ago, and another uh, group recently uh, published data to confirm that. So all flu viruses spread better in dry, cold air than they do in humid air? That's right. Because of the lipid surface of the virus? Right, lipid envelope, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, could you talk about this strange combination of swine genes, bird genes, and human genes in this AH1N1 virus that no one has ever seen before? What I understand, the uh, triple combination has been circulating in pigs for about 10 years. So the virus that is now spreading among humans has only added genes from one additional source. You know, all influenza A viruses are essentially avian viruses that have mutated to allow uh, spread in human populations. And uh, some of that mutation or the reassortment of the gene segments are purported to occur in swine. And the reason is that swine can be infected with both avian viruses and human viruses. So it's called the mixing vessel and infection of two viruses into the same cell at the same time can lead to reassortment of those viruses. There are eight different gene segments, and you can get all different combinations of those gene segments in the uh, progeny of that reassortment. So that's why uh, many of these viruses may come from swine. It's because the swine allows the mixing of the genes. But remember that all A viruses originally were avian, bird viruses. Hmm. Only B, influenza B, is a human virus. The swine for the last 10 years have been carrying which combination? There are 18 segments in this flu virus, and uh, they come from four different sources. The North American swine, the Eurasian swine, North American human, and avian. Okay. 
What is your personal opinion right now in May of 2009 about what you are expecting might happen in the fall of 2009 in the United States? Well, if we don't see progression this spring, like they've seen in Mexico, then I think that it will fire off again next fall and we'll have another outbreak. Based on all of the work that you have done for so long, would you expect that the fall 2009 version of a H1N1 would be more virulent? Not necessarily more virulent, but I think the infection rate would be more intense and we would have a lot of young people infected and there would be serious consequences, including death. Do we have enough time to develop a vaccine between now and the fall? Yes, we do have enough time. Uh, The manufacturers have told us in the past that if they're making a single virus component vaccine, they could uh, do that in three months. You know, ordinarily it takes six months, but our current seasonal vaccine has three different viruses in it, so that takes six months. But a single component vaccine should only take three months, so we should have a vaccine available. If everything went smoothly and there were no technical glitches, we should have vaccine in three months. When you say single component, do you mean doing a vaccine that would be specific to just a H1N1? Right. It would just have that virus in it. You know, the current seasonal vaccine has a H3N2 and the previous a H1N1 and influenza B. So if you made a vaccine just to this 2009 H1N1, It should only take three months. Is there a downside in May of 2009 of making a decision to do a vaccine focused on a H1N1? I don't know of any downside. Okay. Is there a possibility that a H1N1 could mutate between now and the fall of 2009? Yes, it's possible, but the new variants arise from immune pressures. That means when the population is already immune to that virus, then new variants appear. But for this particular virus, as near as we know, most of the population is susceptible. So there's no immune pressure, at least, that would cause this virus to change. So I would expect a vaccine made from the virus they recovered right now to be effective next fall. And why was the 1918 pandemic, that specific virus known as Spanish flu, Why was it so virulent compared, let's say, to this new swine flu? Well, virologically, they've found that the current swine virus lacks one of the gene segments that determines virulence and uh, a particular part of it. So they assume that particular gene segment is not the same as 1918 or that it won't be as virulent. I don't know whether we can say that, but so far, I think uh, I have no reason to disagree with that. So looking at the uh, genome sequencing in the virus is looking for a specific virulence that we know from the past, or in this case, we might have dodged a virus bullet? Well, I wouldn't say we've dodged a virus bullet. I mean, we don't control seasonal influenza now. We have somewhere between 30 and 50,000 deaths a year, and we have 200 to 500,000 hospitalizations a year due to flu. So any flu is bad, and particularly any flu to which almost everybody is susceptible is bad. So it may not be as bad as 1918, but it could be as bad as seasonal flu, which is bad, which we have not controlled up till now. So I think we need to uh, get to work on this. And in the fall, it could be as bad as, say, Hong Kong 68? Yes. And that was pretty bad. Right. 57 was worse. The Asian flu. Right. How many people died in the 57 Asian flu in, let's say, the United States? Oh, probably about 77,000, I think. Twice what the current rate is. Right. The World Health Organization says as many as 2 billion people could be infected by the new AH1N1 virus if the current outbreak continues to spread. According to WHO, in some previous pandemics, one-third of the world's population has been infected. So with a world population of 6 billion people now, it is reasonable to expect 2 billion infections. 
WHO spokesman Gregory Hartle told reporters in early May 2009, quote, I would like to remind people that in 1918, the Spanish flu showed a surge in the spring and then disappeared in the summer months, only to return in the autumn of 1918 with a vengeance. And we know that Spanish flu virus, returning in the fall, eventually killed at least 40 to 50 million people. Close quote. Thanks for listening to this Earth Files podcast from the edges of science, environment, and real X-Files. Go to www.earthfiles.com to see more than a thousand Earth Files reports with photographs, drawings, and documents. And visit Earth Files every day, every week, for new reports and new podcasts. That's www.earthfiles.com. 